Many years ago, while the bush war was still raging, I had the opportunity of meeting an ex-terrorist. At the time, I reminded myself that I should listen carefully to what he had to say to me, because uh, the occasion would not uh, repeat itself again. He was introduced to me as Max, and uh, we sat down on a bench in Salisbury Park, dressed in civvies, and I listened as he spoke. Uh, he told me he was from Bulawayo, that uh, he lived in Luvevi Township, and that he worked there as an artisan's assistant uh, in an engineering firm. And one evening, uh, there was a disturbance outside his house, and he opened the door to find out what was going on. And there were a crowd of people that were being marshaled together, and he got caught up in this. Um, it was a Zapu um, group of terrorists that were going almost brazenly from home to home, uh, rounding up young men um, to fight for their cause. And uh, he wasn't even able to go back into his house to, to get anything. He, he was just compelled to, to go with the group. And so they reached the outskirts of the township, and from there it was a forced march uh, across the countryside for a few days, up to the Botswana border, across the border, and then from there uh, into aeroplanes, and they were flown to, to Zambia. He was taken to a training camp that was being administered by uh, Russian instructors, and uh, although the place was well organized, he said, uh, the training was very hard. Um, discipline was very stern. Uh, you were woken up uh, before sunrise each day, uh, put into covered trucks, driven for many miles, and then um, told to get out of the truck, and you had to run back to the camp before a certain time, because after that that point, you would not be getting any breakfast. And um, he said um, many's a time that he'd get back to the camp too late. But um, most of their training was um, the normal sort of thing that, that, that soldiers do. Uh, even though he was a terrorist, um, it was... Uh, training that was given along uh, the lines that the Russian army had, although it had been uh, adapted. For example, in the Rhodesian army, if, uh, if you set up an ambush, the corporal will very uh, often look around and look at the terrain, choose the killing ground, and, and, and he will take into account a, a lot of different things and then he'll, he'll set up the ambush accordingly. But not with them. They had no freedom to do that sort of thing. They would be um, told, right, if you're going to do a vehicle ambush, for example, you pace from the edge of the road. One, two, three, four, twenty paces, then you stop. Okay, this is where you must have the men. And then you'll go five paces this way, stop, one man must be there. Five paces, stop, another man must be positioned there. And so the whole thing would be a drill. And it wouldn't matter if there were rocks or boulders or trees or anything or obstructions around it. it, it that was the drill. And whenever they were in the field and they had to set up a, a, an ambush on a convoy or anything, they would do this. And many a time, of course, they would get, they would get killed for their efforts. But nonetheless, <clears throat> Max progressed well, he tells me. Um, he was appointed as a political commissar, and he, he, he felt that he was doing very well within the, the Zapu cause. And they were called together and told there was a top secret operation, and he was delighted to find out that he was going to be part of it. Um, in a few months' time, they were told, the agricultural show in Salisbury would take place. And they had information that Mr. Ian Smith, our Prime Minister, would be opening up uh, 
the proceedings there. And after he had uh, done that, he would be taken to a certain exhibition hall and shown around. So, Zappa's plan was that they would uh, get a number of men down to Salisbury with explosives, that they would uh, find work uh, at the showgrounds prior to the, the opening of the show, and that that particular exhibition hall would be packed with explosives. Um, the finer details they would uh, work out once they were on the ground and once they were there in the showgrounds, but uh, that, broadly speaking, was, was their idea. And they, they thought that they had a pretty good chance of, of success. And, and so they prepared for it. Max was given extra training in the use of explosives. And he was told, in addition to being the political commissar, he would be responsible for seeing that all the, the detonations occurred correctly as, uh, as they should. So they crossed the Zambezi somewhere near Binga. And they set off on foot uh, to make their way through the bush uh, to the Sonoya area, and which they did so. They they travelled uh, very carefully, avoided security force patrols, uh, avoided the wild animals on the way there, and uh, everything was going quite nicely to plan. However, Max noticed that the man who was in charge of, uh, of this large group, um, a sectorial commander, started dragging his feet. They would stop for uh, unexplained reasons, sometimes for a day or two. And Max became anxious because they had a schedule to work to and, and there wasn't that much of a buffer allowed for delays along the way. And when they came to the railway line and the bridge that crossed the Onani River, the, um, the commander of the group said, uh, we should lay some charges here against the, uh, the bridge and see if we can uh, blow up a train. And Max said to him, excuse me, sir, but we are being um, deflected from our, our task here. Uh, we should get on and, and get going to Salisbury. And uh, the commander was very angry and rebuked Max sternly and said, listen, you're not in charge. You're here to obey orders. And you are the last person in view of the position that you hold to be questioning me. We need to set up a diversion. And what better diversion than to, to blow up a train? She said, a diversion for what? Well, what do we want to divert? We need to get on to Salisbury. We still got to try and find employment there. We got to find a way of smuggling the explosives into the into the showgrounds and then into that building and then laying them properly in the in the way that they are concealed and nobody finds them. And um, it fell on deaf ears. Two men were appointed to to lay explosives uh, along the side of the railway track, and then it seemed that they just sat and waited and waited and waited. They waited for a very, very long time. He said it, 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 it was a couple of days. There was no sign of any, any train movement. And uh, the man said, we wait. The commander said, we will wait. We will blow up a train. And eventually they did hear a train in the distance and it got closer and closer and it moved over the explosives and these were detonated. And Max said, all it did was make a big bang and a lot of dust but the train kept on moving. It wasn't hampered in any way. It wasn't derailed. It just continued on its on its journey. Well, of course, this uh, <clears throat> this attempt at sabotage uh, must have come to the attention of the security forces, because Max said after that they seemed to be on the run, and uh, there was a contact. The group uh, scattered. Uh, Max and the sectorial commander and uh, a couple of handful of men managed to regroup uh, at a certain point in the bush and uh, try and catch their breath and to see what are we going to do now. Uh, but the, the commander was still reluctant to move. 
even though they were in a very dangerous uh, location with troops swarming around all over, uh, he decided he wanted to stay put. And Max put it to him. Have you got a problem with this operation? You seem, it seems like you're scared you don't want to get to Salisbury. Well, that got a terrible response from the man. He, uh, he was enraged and uh, he had uh, the men uh, take Max and tie him to a tree. Uh, his hands were held above his head and uh, he, he, he was beaten. They were ordered in turn to beat him. And he says this continued for, for most of that day. They left him alone that night as far as he remembers. They didn't leave him alone on other nights. Unexpectedly, as he hung there in the tree, they would just start beating him. And he said he thinks this went on for about three days. He was given no food and no water. And he was, he was in terrible agony. He, was, he said the pain was something that he could hardly endure. And he begged for mercy he, and the man would not listen. The man would not listen. And he kept saying, you dog, you dog, you will learn who's in charge here. You will never question me again. And until you learn that lesson, you will stay tied to that tree. But eventually he was cut loose. He said, but those days and those nights when I hung there, he said, I did a lot of thinking. I did a lot of thinking and I thought to myself, how can I possibly align myself to a cause like this? I have seen men buried alive on the parade square for infringements of rules. We had to march over them section by section and stamp the ground down on their graves and sing Chumarenga songs while we were doing that. I have been hanging here for three days. I have been beaten, but I have done my best. I've put my heart and soul into the cause of freedom. And this is the way that I get treated. To be called a dog, to be treated less than a dog. I'm out of here. First chance I get. And he said he was so determined. And the opportunity came. Not long after that, they uh, were running short of food. And um, they said to him, Max, you're going to go into that store over there. You leave your weapons here. We're going to go with you. Uh, we'll be watching the store. You go in, go and buy some food and come back. And they gave him money. So he, um, he went into the store, selected some items off the shelf, uh, went to the counter to pay for it. And then he noticed through a back window that there was a bus standing at the rear of the building. And uh, when he looked, he saw that there was a door uh, leading to the back yard of the, of the shop and that this would not be seen from where his comrades were waiting. So he, uh, he left the groceries, uh, slipped out through the back door and uh, jumped onto the bus. And he had the, the money with him that he had been given to buy food with. So he could pay for a ticket. And uh, the bus pulled out and Max uh, bent uh, as low as he possibly could so that he couldn't be seen from outside. And uh, he managed in that way to escape uh, from his comrades. And he said each mile that went by he just relaxed more and more and more. And he couldn't believe his good fortune that he had got away. Uh, when they arrived at Sonoya he decided that he would hand himself over, so he went to the police station. And uh, if he thought that they were going to just um, deal with him very efficiently, uh, he was very much mistaken. The, the place was crowded with people there on all sorts of business. And when he did get a, a turn to talk, he, uh, they asked him what he wanted. He said, I, I want to surrender. I'm a terrorist. And they said, go and wait over there. We'll, we'll speak to you in a moment. We'll deal with you. And he was just left there. And uh, a couple of times uh, one constable would ask another, 
uh, what is that man doing standing over there? What does he want? And they'd say, oh, just leave him. He's, he's some kind of a, a story that he's a terrorist. We'll, you know, we'll see to him later. And time passed. <clears throat> so Max walked out of the front door and stood there wondering what was the next best thing to do. Um, and he saw a, a small group of uh, white uh, patrol officers standing near uh, a Land Rover. So he walked up to them and he, he just waited there until one of them said, what do you want? And uh, he said, I, I would like to surrender. I'm a, I'm a terrorist. And they said, you must go inside and go and report to the people there. And he said, I've been there and nobody's paying any attention to me. So they said, well, go back inside there. And so then he got a brainwave and he remembered that he had a, a tocker of pistol with him. So he thought, if I produce this as evidence that I'm a, a terrorist, they'll see that, uh, that, uh, that I'm serious. So he, he, he pulled out this pistol, and, and but before he could say a word, they saw this. And uh, they jumped all over him. He was handcuffed, disarmed. And then he was bodily dragged into the cells at Sonoya Police Station. And uh, there they listened to him. And so it was that uh, a certain specialist unit in the Defence Force came and fetched him there, uh, made him an offer that he couldn't refuse, and uh, he accepted that, joined them, avoided prison, and, uh, and so it was on that particular day that I uh, was able to talk to him. And after I heard his story, I shook hands and uh, we parted uh, with smiles on uh, the very best of terms under those circumstances. And I never saw him again. But he left a very deep impression upon me. And uh, I would like to say to him, if he was ever to watch this clip, that Max, my China, I have changed as many details as I could in your story to protect your identity. I hope that your former Zapu comrades uh, did not find you uh, when the Patriotic Front came to power. Um, but you need to know uh, you did the right thing handing yourself over. Uh, reason may have spoken while we sat in the park, but I promise you, had we met in the bush before that, it would not have been reason talking, it would have been instinct, and we would have seen uh, who would have told the story afterwards. <laughs>